Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Hey, Lisa. You okay? I'm good, thanks. It's good, been good. a lovely Monday talking to all you fantastic creative. <laughs> um, so can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your involvement with the creative arts? Yeah, um, my name's Sarah Dennis. I'm a musician, songwriter, um, writer. Um, I worked for the library service for a long time and I uh, put together the Middlesbrough Literary Festival, which introduced me to a whole world of local, national and international artists. And I pretty much live that life, really, a um, life of culture and, and gigs and that when, when we used to gig. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I've done all sorts over the years. I've played some fantastic venues um, and I also run Forklines, um, which has been running for nine years in Middlesbrough now. Um, we tend to move about a bit within, but we're always focused in central Middlesbrough and it's all about folk, music, spoken word, you know, maybe a bit of comedy from time to time. So luckily we're going to be working with the town hall in Middlesbrough um when we get the go ahead we keep getting the go ahead then it keeps getting stopped and you know just like everywhere else really so we just have to keep strong keep focused and you know keep keep hoping that we'll soon be out of this lockdown and we can go to do our proper jobs again <laughs> yeah um uh yeah folk lines is, is is such a such a joy to attend um our, our you know you're I mean it, it, yourself you're like you know you sing like a nightingale you're like uh, I I mean I owe you you know big debts of all kinds of gratitude um performing for you at folk lines at base camp opened up a lot of other opportunities for me oh wow uh, that, that and that's what's behind Falklands really is we 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 hope that because we know we've got such a good audience we hope that people will get other gigs from it and kind of like a sounding board or a platform you know for, for various people um who do different things so that's i'm so pleased to hear that because that's exactly what what we want from folk lines that's the heart of it really yeah brilliant well it absolutely did that for me so thank you very much and you taught me to play ukulele so um... oh, I did, did. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't need much teaching though to be honest come on <laughs> Well, you might say that, but it really, really changed things for me. Oh, brilliant. It was, it was, I mean, I had to stop in the end because I got so obsessed with it. I got repetitive strain injury. Oh yeah. It'll get you like that. They won't leave your side. It becomes your best friend. You're your little ukulele. <laughs> yeah. It kept me sane. It really yeah. did. It was, it, it was like, I was in a bad place at the time and it was just, I just kept escaping in, into oh. the, compounding my problems, but too much escapism, but yeah how it was but let's let's take things back so has this always been the way for you um have you always been creative from a kid did you come from a creative background where where did it all start yeah yeah um i've been involved with music as long as i can remember um i was lucky that my my grandfather and my my father were musicians jazz musicians and music teachers as well they used to teach in lots of local schools drums percussion um percussion woodwind cornet that kind of thing and because we were we were a musical family, when I got to the age of five, I remember my granddad, Billy, Billy Dennis, saying to me, choose an instrument. And he had this amazing piano that I loved. And I said, yeah, I want to play the piano. So by the time um, I put in, went to go for some private lessons and um, because I was only five, you have to have a certain level. Back then you did, it's different now. You had to have a certain level of um, math mathematics skills to be able to learn how to read music and do your theory and stuff. So I had to wait till the ripe old age of six to start my lessons. <laughs> so I started there and then I started to play the cello um, and I was just absolutely music obsessed. It was all about doing my grades, learning my theory, performing in festivals, you know, that kind of thing. I was doing all that at a really young age. Um, and like you say, sometimes you can just become so obsessed with something, it, it sort of takes you out of this world and, you know, so yeah, I was crackers about it. So then when I, when I was at school, I was the music monitor <laughs> at school with my little badge on and I used to, um, I used to script all the different arrangements for the recorders and things like that. So I was a complete and utter nerd, that, you know, <laughs> but also at the same time, I loved um, literature and books, um, reading and I was always writing so I was always doing poetry and writing songs and that from, from being about seven or eight really putting plays on that kind of thing 
and drawing as well. I used to love drawing as well. I don't do that as much now, but, and you know, it's just music's always been with me really. Yeah. Terrific. So, well, it's, yeah. um, uh, it's great to have always been immersed in that world. Very uh, lucky like that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, um, I, I've got so much I want to ask you, but t tell me, tell us a little bit about some of the different projects. Like, I didn't know that you'd set up like a, the, which, which festival did you say is like some kind of literary festival? Yeah, it was the Middlesbrough Literary Festival that um, I started in 2009 um, and it ran till 2013. And it was called the Middlesbrough Literary Festival. And then that morphed into Crossing the T's. So that was the birthplace of Crossing the T's really was the Middlesbrough Literary Festival. Um, and basically it's just because in, in my library job I was reader development manager and adult services manager so my, part of my big part of my job was audience development so it was getting people to use the services to know all the, the different services we had but, but uh, really doing so lots of publicity by doing big events and and we had some excellent you know people from all over the world really we had uh, Sarah Waters she was uh, fantastic and that was a bit of a dream come true for us um, we had Kathy Lett, she came and gave a talk and just absolutely stole everybody's heart in Middlesbrough because she was so fantastic. Um, and loads more that I can't even remember. Wow. I still have all the brochures though, so you know, I have a look through from now and, now and then and think, how the hell did we do that? <laughs> right, you know, you see this, because I didn't know anything about this, it was kind of a bit before my time, I had two young lads at that time and <laughs> no idea that I could go to university or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so yeah these are really important historical documents that I think we need to uh, you know put together and um, and and collate you know all the people that I know they've done so much and um, really keen to make sure that that's that, that has and, and, and on that point as well um, just before I left there's a lot of people made redundant because of the, the government cuts and a lot of us went at the same time in 2013 and just before we, we left, I'd been in discussion with the reference librarian, brilliant librarian called um, Jenny, Jenny Parker. And we were work, going to work on putting together a whole collection. I mean, there is one there in the reference library, a whole collection of brochures and, and information about all the arts, the local arts scene. Because when working in libraries, especially in reference, you've always got to be thinking kind of 30 years ahead. Who's going to be coming in in 30 years to come and research what was happening at this time that we're in now? And we we did we thought like that and we we worked well together. But unfortunately, we as we were putting stuff together, um, unfortunately, we both had to leave. But that's you know that's just that's life, isn't it? But she, but before before that, we did start putting. A, so there is if you go to the reference library when it's open. Um, there is a good local studies collection, very cultural, local culture. Plus also um, Andy Croft from Smokestack Books, who was also the curator of Tea Junction. Um, we did have a meeting a few years ago where all of us who were working in the arts got together and we talked about creative writing and all the literary festivals that have happened. So it's worth getting together with, with him and Bob and, and you know seeing where we go from there because it's already, we've made a start so we can build on that now, which is, what we need to do <laughs> that's brilliant that's really massively valuable and i know sort of even predating that that uh trev teasdale's got um kind yeah. of old archives of when he started off and you know i know oh, uh, trev was a pivotal part of that meeting and 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 trev's got such a brilliant archive of of stuff that you know he's just well he's amazing trev isn't he <laughs> you know <what> yeah <laughs> yeah and for me he's a real connect back to um because he was involved with the original arts lab yeah um, mm -hmm. the original movement um I, I, you know back in Coventry back in the day and so yeah. it's, um yeah. it's kind of uh, he's I think most of the current arts labs have somebody that was involved back in the day and so it's great that we've, we've got Trev um yeah. yeah brilliant so um tell us a bit about Peg Paula right um Peg Paula um the band are the the Grindelu. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, for, for people who don't know about them, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bit of that and, and about the band, of course, as well. Well, the, the folklore is that um, Peg Paula is the hag of the teas who, who lives under the river and um, she pulls in young children by the walls and wayward young drunken men and devours them in 
in her den that's called Hell's Kettles, um, which are these massive wells that are underneath the tea. All it was, it was, for, it was folklore to say that, you know, to, to little kids, don't be playing too close to the River Tees because Peg Powler will get you, just because it was such a, a dangerous river. I think Tees in, in Anglo-Saxon, it means bubbling or boiling. So it was a very, very dangerous river because... So, um, yeah, so she was this hag. So I just love the story of Peg Powler. Um, and when we were looking for a band name, when we got together in 2015, I suggested it and they were like, yeah, great, nice one. So <laughs> we stuck with that because a lot of our songs are kind of fairy tales and dark myths and, you know, they're all a bit on the, the dark folky side. So it did it did go with the with the name. So, yeah, um, we, we, we've we've changed and um, a couple of people have left. So we've we've got some new. We've got some new recruits into Peg Paula, so we can't wait to get going. The, the start of last year, we were rehearsing like crazy and we were really getting it together. And then all of a sudden, obviously, you know, yeah. <laughs> Here we are, yes. But we're still, we're still together, we're still wearing to go and we can't wait to get back together. And we've got loads of ideas. That's the thing, we just need to push them forward now. Mm. Terrific. And... Yeah, so tell me about this absolutely amazing work that um, is coming out at the moment. Um, I've heard three parts of it, of uh, your project with Bob Beagree. Yeah, The Shrouded Republic, yeah. Um, I'm, again, I'm amazed that we've got that done during lockdown, but it's, it's just come together and um, it's wonderful to be involved with. I, I started working with Bob as a musician um, when he did uh, Lee Sung Spell and he asked me to join him and... and and that was an, an amazing thing, taking us on tour across the UK and everything like that it was just fantastic. Just working with, with brilliant musicians and poets and it was it's just a dream come true, really. Um, so The Shrouded Republic is the, the third the third big act we've worked on together um, as a band. Um, and we each recorded our things at home and sent them into Stu, Stuart Forth, who, who puts it all together and does all the mixing and adds all the strange effects and the techno, techno stuff, <laughs> as he does, he loves it. Um, so we, we recorded part of it in a church in, I can't remember where now, but somewhere in, in North Yorkshire, we recorded it in a, in a church because one of the member, members, Peter, is, works with the Church's Conservation Trust. So he has access to all these really cool old medieval churches and stuff. Uh, but when we went in there, there was this massive, right in the middle was this massive pipe organ. So I'm just like, oh, let me on there. So I'm there pulling up all these stops and, you know, playing all these tunes. And then, but it needed to be pumped um, by hand because it's massive bellows inside to, to make the pipes work. Nice. So Bob's pumping this thing like this, going crazy. And I'm playing this daft little blues tune. Um, and unbeknownst to us, somebody was recording it, somebody else in the band was recording it. And then when we listened back to it, it was so funny and it just cracked us up so much that we, we had to include it in, in there. And now I can't get the daft riff out my head. <laughs> so hopefully it's infectious. <laughs> mm, these, these are the earworms that um, take over the world. Yeah, but it's amazing to be able to work with Bob because he's got such vision. Um, and he knows he knows what he wants for it, but he wants us to put our own spin on 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 his words and 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 his story. And, and it's brilliant to be able to work like that. It's, it's a real honour working with Bob. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, he was uh, obviously a massive influence on me because you know, just at the point at where you know your your, your involvement um, was diminished by you know cuts or whatever you call them. Uh, that was that was when I first started at uni. It was twenty thirteen. Wow! Yeah, it was. Um, He's the guru, Bob, isn't he? He's our guru. Yeah, and and, and you know, so humble. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah. You know, yeah. That I think all that um, Tai Chi and uh, all the you know he's he's done a lot of work on himself. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely comes across. So normally I round it off with um, with the lockdown question, but I think we've covered that. Um, yeah, look, you know, it's a, this has been a six months project. So we started in July and uh, we're coming into the last week of it. And um, it's just been like 
the first interviews were like all oh, were coming out and then we're going back in and you know and all the plans people that make and particularly like people with venues where there's so, so a real big cost element to making and then breaking plans yeah uh, but we are where we are um we all seem to be holding up pretty well um yeah. taking yeah. it on the chin i think you know having a life in the arts means that perhaps we were better prepared for a constantly changing uncertain world where we don't know where the next meal's coming from or i think that's right when you work in the arts it is it's kind of feast or famine isn't it you've you, you've got to go for long periods without work and you know whether you're a, somebody who does things on a local scale national or even sort of huge stars people go without you know where there's unfertile times and they have to live live within the means as much as they can yeah, the thing, is, the thing is just not to let go of that, of your vision, isn't it? It's just to think, you know, and there's, there's so many times I think we've all thought as artists that, oh, is it worth it? Is it worth the pressure? Is it worth the stress? But of course it is. It is because if you didn't have it, you'd have nothing really. Yeah, <laughs> that absolutely. thing that drove you from the inside would just be gone and, you know, you would lose a, you know, a big part of yourself. Yeah, and this has been another thing that's been really brilliant about these interviews is seeing like, you know, people of my generation, like I was told, like, like go and do a proper job, you know, <laughs> proper exams, get a proper job. And so many people of, of kind of my generation that have done that and then have clawed their way back into yeah. it. But yeah. really heartening to see that actually um, the younger generation are being told, like, go and fulfil your dreams. Yeah. Mm. And that, that's terrific. Um, absolutely yeah so it's been absolutely lovely to talk yeah, to you it's been great yeah it's been great it's, you know it's a lovely lovely uh inspiring project this um, i just feel completely blessed full of gratitude that i get to speak to people like you and uh, oh and thank you for keeping us all going and, and giving us a kick up the bum when we need it as well because you do that really well <laughs> in the gentlest yeah. possible way of course <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for keep it going and 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 you know constantly searching for ideas and and ways and means and funding to be able to produce arts and get it promoted and make people see which is what we all do when we work in Teesside we're very fiercely proud of of who we are and and of getting that like Teesside on on the map that's that's always at the heart of the, the things that I do I think that's so important yeah absolutely I was saying to uh, there's there's a there's a Twitter uh, account called please spell it tea side oh. and uh and i've had quite a few instances lately where people have misspelled it and it pops up and it says please sell it and i was saying to him last night because i had another one and i just tagged him in and said are you gonna take this or shall i <laughs> and uh, saying i think kind of i'll feel like my work here is done when you don't have to tell anyone anymore that tea side has two s's in it yeah <laughs> two yeah two e's two s's and drop the extra is it extra o in Middlesbrough? <laughs> Although that was actually he's like Libby girl. That was a spelling mistake <laughs> when the town was registered. It was um, it should have been Middlesbrough as the football team <laughs> and every other borough. And the uh, illiterate town clerk couldn't spell it apparently. So <laughs> we are stuck without an o. <laughs> but then we get really mad when people put it in. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I did an interview um, on a podcast a few months ago where they, he was being from Tyneside and <laughs> that the best start ever and then they did forget an S, but we've got over all that now. Sarah, that, um, I just can't wait until we can get out there and oh, uh, see you again, but in the meantime, um, hopefully you'll come on my radio show in a, in a week or so. Yes, please, love yes, to. With your beautiful music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, take care, darling. Okay, bye, darling, bye.